I was kind of a bit nonplussed when um, uh, uh, I was asked to do this. Um, obviously, there's an issue today about unions using the slogan Aussie Jobs, uh, Aussie Workers for Aussie Jobs, Aussie Jobs for Aussie Workers. Um, and obviously, uh, White Australia involved um, an attempt to exclude immigrants of a particular kind, like most of the world's population, um, from uh, coming to Australia uh, to work. Um, and it was kind of like, which aspect of the vast experience of White Australia would be most interesting? So I picked out uh, a few things uh, to talk about, and I hope it kind of works uh, for this. Um, I want to start by saying that the unions that are using this slogan are dealing with extremely serious challenges. Um, you know, the experience of the uh, maritime workers, uh, you know, being sacked uh, from their job uh, on the Portland, um, a, 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 and then a replacement crew brought in uh, using uh, laws that allow government, uh, uh, businesses to do this. Um, the uh, uh, companies are hiring uh, workers on uh, in order to either break union organisations, replace union organisations, or just, in fact, to replace local workers. Uh, it's happening in the meatworks, it's happening in construction. Uh, uh, very, very serious issues. You've got that. And of course, then that's tied to the scandals that we've seen um, the incredible exploitation and oppression of uh, uh, students, international students in agriculture, 7 Eleven stores, and so on. Uh, and, and it is not an easy struggle. And I think, you know, our starting point, of course, is, is support for union attempts to prevent uh, employers uh, dramatically worsening working conditions uh, and, and attempting to break the union. But the, the, it's interesting, the scale of uh, temporary migration visas that's being used today is colossal. And until I started looking at it, I had no idea how big it is. There's something like one, nearly one and a half million Migrants in Australia are temporary migrants with work with the right to work. Um, so we're not talking about a few thousand people here or there. And it is that there is an extremely systematic uh, exercise uh, involved. Um, I've, I've been talking to the Meat Workers Union in uh, Queensland, and they can tell you, you know, you have a, a meat works in a, in a town. Um, you know, the season ends. Uh, then the next year, there's an entirely migrant workforce brought in and uh, locals have, have no work. Uh, and they're brought in on temporary visas. Um, very, very serious. And, and of course, the, the temptation is to precisely to go to those kind of uh, nationalist slogans. Um, so very, very large scale use of immigrant labor. But I think what's interesting about that example is that actually, that's exactly the same thing that's happening uh, in the coal mines. Uh, and, and in mines, except that it's not foreign workers that are being uh, brought in uh, to prevent quite unquote local workers from working. It's where the mines are saying you have to be a fly in, fly out worker to work in our mine. And so there's all these mining um, towns where local miners cannot get employment because they're local. And you have to fly in from Gladstone, Mackay, Brisbane, or somewhere else to work in a mine when there are miners who live just down the road. So I think it's important to see this is part of a particular ruling class attack. Uh, sometimes uh, uh, migrants are being used, sometimes it's just simply using workers living in other parts of Australia. But it's a very serious problem. But of course, and I think it's obvious, our argument is that the slogan and the attempt to link this to nationalism is, um, is a serious mistake. So anyway, I'm going to go back and look at it look at a very important incident in the development of the wider Australia policy. I'm not going to look at the 20th century experience much, um, which is the most important industrial dispute in Australia before 1890. Uh, the great strikes of the 1890s, which led to the, the uh, formation of the Labor Party, uh, a radicalisation in the uh, working class and so on. And that was the, the seafarers' strike of 1878. And in brief, the story is, the Australasian Steam Navigation Company was the biggest company, the biggest business in Australia. It had, its capital was half a million pounds at a time when a hundred pounds a year was a tradesperson's wage. So it's talking about this colossal enterprise, which um, had a large proportion of coastal and some overseas shipping from Australia. 
And so from around early, mid 1878, they started replacing, and it was a newly formed Seafarers Union, newly formed Seamen's Union, which was quite militant. And they started from uh, when they couldn't get uh, particular uh, concessions from the Union, they started to bring Chinese seafarers in from southern China to work as crew. Uh, this led to an escalating dispute, which led to a strike in the middle of November, not 1878, an all-out strike uh, on ASN. And this was, as I said, a massive strike. There was literally thousands of wharf labourers went out on strike in support. First of all, they uh, refused to load the ships. Coal miners refused to cut coal for the ships and were stood down. This was a major dispute. The tragedy is that the Seafarers Union, which had no history, as far as I can see and other researchers can see, of any form of racism, decided to organise the dispute as a dispute, uh, as an anti-Chinese crusade. The problem is we've got Chinese people coming to Australia. That's the problem. They will destroy our conditions, their tools in the hands of the bosses, um, you know, they'll degrade our wages and conditions, we'll all just be serfs and slaves. That's the way they fought the dispute. Um, there were anti-Chinese riots in a number of towns and cities, including the burning of a lot of Chinese shops in George Street in Sydney. Um, and the, the strike ended uh, with a, a, a massive victory to the Union. Amongst other things, the company was trying to bring 300 Chinese sailors uh, on a ship from Hong Kong and the ship sank. The, 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 no, I don't think the, 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 the sailors weren't killed. They, they were able, people, people's lives were saved, but it meant that the, eff, the, the scabbing effort was, um, was, was, uh, uh, was, was undermined. Obviously, you know, we, if we'd been there at the time, we would have supported the strike. You know, an attempt to break the union, uh, decisively break the union and degrade working conditions, obviously you support the strike. What you don't support uh, is the politics of the strike. Now this strike's important because it is central to the entire um, mythology, the entire kind of folk narrative of this wide Australian policy that developed over the ensuing decades and hundred years until White Australia got rid of. Here was the classic example of, and this was the, the mythology of White Australia, the bosses want cheap coloured labour. Here's the, here's, here's, it, this proves it, doesn't it? They want cheap coloured labour, bring it in, destroy our conditions, and actually, therefore, White Australia is a working class demand to defend our jobs and conditions. That's the story. Um, and obviously, there was, a part of the story um, was, was, was correct. Um, and so excluding coloured people, quote unquote, was central to protecting the working class. Now, the first, the first thing I want to say is that there was no history of anti-Chinese politics uh, in the Union, historically. There wasn't even particularly a history of racism on ships. In fact, uh, shipping, crewing ships was a multi-ethnic, multicultural exercise. There were sailors from all kinds of different parts of the world, the British Empire, uh, on ships. What there was at the time, however, was that the ruling class, initially in Queensland, but especially in uh, Sydney and Victoria, uh, were moving towards uh, a politics of excluding Chinese immigrants for quite different reasons than the unions. Um, they feared that China had the population to colonise Australia to be a rival colonial power on the Australian continent, we tend to think, you know, we tend to just assume that Australia is one nation. Sorry. Um, but, but of course, it's, it's, you know, that's something that actually had to be politically critical. Um, you know, there was no labour movement in Sydney, there was no labour movement campaigning against Chinese immigration before the strike. There was, however, constant anti-Chinese agitation in the main, main ruling class papers of the time. And so my, my belief, and it's shared by a few others, is that actually the Union adopted this anti-Chinese crusade precisely because they knew that they would get some ruling class support if they posed the strike in these terms, because the ruling class doesn't like strikes, does it? And of course, so, so I, want to, um, I want to go through some of the ways I, I believe that this uh, action um, undermined and weakened the working class. As I said to start with, the, 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 the union won the strike. Um, it was a massive defeat for the company. The company, about within 10 years, the company had gone broke. Um, so firstly, 
But the first way I want to do it is to talk about um, the way that the strike um, revived the political fortunes of one of the most vicious anti-working class and anti-union politicians that Australia had in the 19th century, Sir Henry Parks, who is commonly seen as the architect of Federation. <clears throat> Parks had been a Chartist as a young man in Britain, come to Australia, got caught up with the uh, emerging bourgeois politics of the 1850s, 1840s, 1850s in Australia, become Premier, and basically he was a serial bankrupt who was bailed out time and time again by the very rich in New South Wales. He was a free trader, he was hostile to welfare, um, he was, anyway, you'll, you'll, you'll get the story. In 1877, uh, there'd been a, there was a recession and there'd been a major working class campaign, labour movement campaign against assisted immigration, that is where the government subsidises people to come uh, and settle in Australia from Britain. A major working class campaign. Parks was virulently in favour of assisted immigration, very high levels of assisted immigration. The union said you're just flooding the labour market, people can't get jobs. The election of 1877, Parks was humiliated. He lost his seat in Parliament. He had, to, you know, he was, he was, and he was, he lost his support in Parliament. Everyone thought he was finished as a politician. Then along comes the strike. Parks was an anti, Parks was an anti-Chinese politician. So how did Parks get himself back as a major political figure? There were two things he did. The first was he gave this very, very important <coughs> speech um, after the dispute began. He said. You know, we have this problem with Chinese immigration and there's a threat from China. How do we deal with it? How do we protect the British society here in Australia from this threat? Well, we have to populate the place. You know, if we leave it empty, you know, if we refuse to have people come here, how can we protect ourselves against the Chinese? So, of course, this is an argument for higher immigration, precisely the thing that the Labor movement had been campaigning. Now, I'm not saying that the Labor movement was right to campaign against it. Assisted immigration wasn't the same as just uh, immigration. It was, it was, there, was, there was a different edge to it. So that's the first thing. And then the second thing was that um, the movement, uh, the, 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 the movement against the strike was so powerful that it brought down the, uh, the then government. The then government was, I'm not going to go into the politics of it. And so Parks goes from being someone who was completely, everyone thought his career was finished back to becoming Premier. And he didn't just become Premier, because he had been seen to support the anti-Chinese movement, and then the year later, he moves an anti-Chinese uh, anti immigration bill in Parliament. The Labor movement says he's a friend of Labor. He's a friend of Labor. Uh, when you got elected, when you got given a ministerial post at that time in uh, Parliament, the tradition was that you then had to resign your seat in Parliament and recontest it on the basis that, uh, that your electors should say, yes, you should, you're right to join this government. It would be a very good thing to do again these days. <laughs> um, anyway, that was a, one of the democratic elements. Now, in Parks' government included, again, uh, the Secretary of the Chamber of Commerce, widely seen as completely viciously anti-union. <coughs> However, when the, um, as a consequence of the, of the change of government um, the, and the belief that Parks would, as he did, bring in this anti-Chinese law, the opposition to Parks, to these people becoming the government, just, just literally just melted, melted away. So in other words, the anti the, 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 the uh, the framing of this dispute as an anti-Chinese dispute, as, as distinct from one against the bosses, meant that the Labour movement actually wrongly saw this person as being um, you know, sympathetic to Labour, which of course is, is a terrible thing. It means that you disarm a whole chunk of the working class population against one of their great enemies. And I was just thinking, the other, thinking when I was thinking about this, I was thinking, well, of course, we have the, the parallel today. What did we see in South Australia? Destruction of the car industry. What's the response of the unions? You know, amongst other things, it's, oh, there's going to be these new submarines built. We've got to build them, right? Aussie jobs. We've got to build the submarines. Who's the champion for building the submarines? Nick Xenophon. Who gets three members, three, three senators? There's three senators? 
Nick Xenophon. What does Nick Xenophon think about the Australian Building Construction Commission? With minor amendments, he supports it. And so the logic of Aussie jobs for Aussie workers is you support Nick Xenophon and Nick Xenophon supports the ABCC. Number one. Number two. So you want jobs, Aussie jobs for Aussie workers. So we want to build the submarines. So what we do is we end up saying the government's going to spend $50,000 million on these appalling weapons of war. And we support that. Like, is that really what we want? Submarines? $50 billion on submarines? Is that really what the working class needs? Aussie jobs, Aussie workers, you campaign for the subs, you don't say anything against them. That's the logic, and I think there's a parallel. Okay, so that's the first effect. That's 50. Yeah. Okay, the second effect. Um, I should just go on to say, Parks rewarded the Labor movement the following year, in, uh, 18, uh, in 1880. There was a massive, <coughs> massive, massive dispute um, over controlling the price of coal in the coal fields of northern New South Wales, um, in the Hunter Valley. And I'll tell you, the coal miners, they were the, the best organised union in New South Wales. Um, and let's just say that the coal miners were people who were prepared to use the most, the extremes of persuasion, <laughs> can I put it that way? The extremes of persuasion to stop scabbing. Um, so there's this massive strike uh, in, in uh, the Hunter Valley uh, to, as I said, to maintain uh, uh, wages for everybody, jobs. This was a, a really great strike. So how did Parks reward the working class? How did he show his support for the labour movement? He sent the police, of course with 10,000 rounds of ammunition and he sent the artillery, field guns. He sent field guns into the Hunter Valley to intimidate the strikers into giving up the strike. And, they, and, they, and, and then that was, the strike was defeated. This was the man who was uh, protecting the Australian working class by stopping Chinese immigration. Okay, the second dimension to this there were two major newspapers in, um, and this is about ideology and how things are framed. There were two major newspapers in New South Wales in Sydney at the time. The Sydney Morning Herald and the Evening News. The Sydney Morning Herald at the time was a bit like the Australian today. Um, facts were, in both newspapers, facts were kind of negotiable. But the Sydney Morning Herald was, your, what we, we would today describe it as ultra-neoliberal. Um, it hated unions, it hated anything, any situation where the workers attempted to limit competition, limit, um, so they were very obviously free trade, uh, you had to be self-reliant, they were utterly hostile to welfare, um, and when the strike came along, I should say, the City Morning Herald, both the newspapers, they were very, very similar. Both of them were very virulently free trade, they hated the Irish, they were militantly Protestant, um, they hated unions and strikes. So the politics of the newspapers were very, very similar. Um, the, for the Sydney Morning Herald, the number one issue was the unions are attempting to protect jobs. Therefore, you, even though they hated Chinese immigration, there's no way that you can support this strike. The strike's got to be terminated. Uh, when Parks introduced the legislation, they attacked him because he was doing this under the coercion of the mob and so on. And needless to say, the City Morning Herald was not widely appreciated by the working class and poor of Sydney. In fact, they hated it. The Evening News, however, was much, much more sophisticated. And it, um, it I'm not going to go into its politics in any detail, but it, it was a nationalist newspaper. A nationalist newspaper. So the Evening News kind of supported the strike as did, incidentally, very large sections of the ruling class, and particularly in Queensland. They said, employers have a duty to the race and the nation. You know, they were absolutely for the rights of property, but there were, there were limits to this. They supported the strike so long as it was legal and orderly, which it wasn't always. They talked about how the military had a duty to crush any disorder. They were much, much more sophisticated at containing and deflecting union militancy. 
um, in the context of the strike and, and, and afterwards. They had a much more sophisticated ideology of the state. It's there to protect the nation, not just there with prop though, not just protect those with property. And of course, but of course in reality, um, it was there to protect people with property. And the evening news, the, the, the Labour movement was desperate to maintain the support of uh, the evening news, which had incidentally was the best selling newspaper in Australia. And I think you can see in the, the way that the bosses are learning to use nationalism and racism to contain our resistance. Actually, it's quite interesting because after the strike, the following year, there was a, 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 an international exhibition in Sydney. And I think it was cabinet makers went on strike. And the rhetoric from the evening news was identical to its rhetoric in the seafarers' strike. It, says, it said, just at this moment, when the whole world is looking at Sydney, we have a national duty to make sure that the international exhibition goes ahead and there's no disruption, and you, you are traitors to the nation for going on strike. So the whole rhetoric became, an, as, it, as it so often is, an attack on the workers. Yeah. We had very much the same thing happen again uh, in 1887, 1888. In 1888, uh, 1887, 1888, there was another anti-Chinese scare uh, begun by the ruling class. There was some labour movement involvement. Parks passed laws through the New South Wales Parliament. He was back in office uh, in 1888. And there were fulsome letters of, um, of appreciation from, uh, from the unions. Let me just see if I can uh, find... Here we go, this will be it. This is... This is uh, OK. The New South Wales branch of the Federated Seamen's Union assured Parks of his having earned the well wishes and admiration of 10,000 seamen composing this body. The Secretary of the Sydney Trades and Labor Council, Robert Boxall, told Parks it behoves us to support them who support us. So what happens in 1889? There's another strike in the Hunter Valley coalfields. What does Parks do? Sends in the military. It behoves us to support them that support us. Um, there was actually a, a, a more profound effect in some ways because in 1887, 1887 was the 50th anniversary of Queen Victoria on the throne. And, of course, what did a, a good obedient colony like New South Wales try to do, which every colony did? It tried to organise what they called a public demonstration in support of appreciation of the Queen. Okay, so it's one of those things, you have the, this big uh, building, you have thousands of people turn up, Worthies make speeches about what a glorious empire it is and what a glorious queen she is and so on. The first two times they tried to do this in um, Sydney, the Republican movement, there was a Republican movement, the Republican movement managed to get into the hall first and completely disrupt and prevent this loyal address from happening. They only got it the third time because they surrounded the building with the military. That's the only way they could have a loyal demonstration in Sydney, uh, in appreciation of the Queen in 1887. 1888, Parks does his uh, next round of anti-Chinese laws. And then, of course, we ultimately get the white Australia policy. Now, one of the leaders of the emerging labour movement, one of the founders of the Australian Work Workers' Union, which of course became known as the AWU, which became known as Australia's weakest union, was a character called W.G. Spence, and he wrote a, a memoir in 1909. And he summed up the dynamic behind white Australia in the context of this republicanism and everything else. He lauded the noticeable change of thought in regard to what may be termed empire matters. The practical, this is what he wrote, the practical independence of government created under the Australian Constitution with the manifest advantages of being part of a big empire under its protection, if need arose, together with the growth of the national spirit of a white Australia and the broad humanitarianism taught by the Labor Party have developed a feeling of loyalty to race rather than governments and have abolished any talk of either republicanism or independence. The First World War um, built on that. It was posed by the government as the First World War as a war to protect 
um, wide Australia. And that was how it was seen by many, many people. Um, the great theorist of White Australia, and the White Australia had a theorist, was a character called um, Charles Henry Pearson, C.H. Pearson. He wrote a book called National Life and Character in uh, 1893. And I'm trying to find my bit of paper with his. Oh, here it is, right in front of me. Okay, Pearson had been education minister in Victoria. He was the intellectual influence over Alfred Deakin, who was three times Prime Minister of Australia. So Pearson is an incredibly important intellectual uh, in early Australian, late colonial, early federal history. This is, um, this is what Pearson uh, had to say. So Pearson was arguing for the importance of nationalism and, and the idea that uh, the poorest man in the country should feel that he owes inestimable ble ble blessings to the political order under which he lives. But in his book, uh, most of which actually is a rant about the dangers of the various coloured and tropical peoples of the world, and how they're a threat to the white races, he actually addressed the issue of socialism. He wrote, only two causes seem likely to interfere with the growth of national feeling. On the one hand, the great body of citizens may be more interested in industrial organisations, stretching over the whole earth, and on the other hand, the dream of a few thinkers that we shall rise beyond the nation, beyond the nation, as we have risen beyond the family, tribe, and province. The first is the more immediate danger. It's possible that a great body of artisans, for instance, taking a supreme interest in the claims of various trades and attaching only a secondary importance to the uh, different countries in which the individual members happen to live. Something of this kind is discernible at present. In other words, we have internationalism in the labour movement and it's a bad thing. <laughs> so how do we deal with it? We, we deal with it... Sorry, 20? 26. 26, okay. A few minutes. Well, for some of the few minutes. Okay. The way we deal with it is we have to ramp up nationalism. We have to get the claims of one body of workers habitually opposed to the needs of others so that it's difficult for them to unite across borders. That's not his words, that's my, my summing up. The trade unions of the future are likely to become not more international in their character, but more exclusively national. Each will try to secure the best possible terms for itself in its own country. Each will protect itself against competition from outside. As a consequence, the mass of men will have to abide in the land where they are born and make the best of it. And of course, we will rule. <laughs> so I think, I think what I'm trying to, I suppose, get at here is that the idea of Aussie jobs for Aussie workers, the idea of attempting to have a nationalist response to globalisation, uh, a nationalist response to the fact that other parts of the world are very poor, colonised or whatever, of course it leads to divide and rule in the sense that we saw in the seafarer strike of 1878 or where we've seen you know, the great steel strike in the United States in 1990 where um, African Americans were used to break a, a strike by a predominantly white workforce and so on. But I think in some ways the equally important and slightly more hidden uh, importance of, of this response is that what it does is it reinforces something which I think was um, came out of the slogan that the Greek comrade talked about, which is the idea that there isn't enough to go around. There isn't enough to go around. There aren't enough jobs. So actually, we've got to fight for the jobs, our jobs, Aussie jobs, against the great unwashed out there. There isn't enough to go around in terms of hospitals and schools, so we can't have these immigrants coming in and using the hospitals and schools. The fact, the idea that there isn't enough to go around, of course it's completely I mean, in a world where 2% of the population produces virtually all the manufactured goods that we use in our everyday life, you know, a world of unbelievable wealth, the idea there isn't enough to go around is completely bizarre. But actually, it's actually the lived experience of ordinary work class people that there isn't enough. That's their lived experience. But the reality, of course, is completely opposite. And so the, the, the material basis for this Aussie jobs 
for Aussie workers is, is that sense of there aren't enough jobs, I can't get a job, I know people who can't get a job, they've applied for 50 jobs, they really want to work, they can't get a job, well, I, have to, I have to move house halfway across the country to get a job, when I get a job I can't afford to buy a house, the local school is crap um, because it's run down, it's not poorly, it's poorly funded, etc. There isn't enough to go around. And so in a world where people feel there isn't enough to go around, they're attracted to this slogan. The trouble is that by being attracted to this slogan, they accept a world in which the bosses tell us that there is enough to go around, where actually there is enough to go around. And it's precisely when workers challenge that and say, actually, there's enough to go around and you're going to give us, you're going to give it to us. But, but to do that, you have to break beyond all the politics that get us to accept uh, this kind of uh, bizarre idea. And when you do it, actually that's when the right wing of politics falls over and where workers' solidarity <coughs> with the oppressed, not just people who are members of their class, but with the oppressed of whatever class, that's when that becomes a real material possibility. And that's the challenge today. So when people say, we have to fight for our own, Everyone, every ordinary person in the world is part of our own. Every, per, every, every oppressed person is our own. The way Lenin put it in What Is To Be Done, which is not primarily a book about how to set up an authoritarian political party, is the model, the model socialist is not the trade union secretary, but the tribune of the oppressed. Because as soon as you accept oppression, as soon as you say there isn't enough to go around, we've got to accept the oppression and just fight for our corner, then actually you've limited the struggle you're prepared to wage. You've limited the issues you're prepared to take up. And you've limited the solidarity that you will both give and that you will seek. And that's why, that's why actually when a union says, oh, we've got too many issues to deal with to worry about refugees, actually, that's the problem. Because actually, you know, it, it, there's, there's, I'll just finish on this. There's a... A book, I don't know if people have ever read Thomas Frank's book, What's the Matter with America? There's a lot of things wrong with it. But there's this wonderful, wonderful section in the introduction where he describes the impact of the politics of what he calls the backlash, the right-wing backlash. Um, this is, he's talking about Kansas, a, a state which had this incredible reputation for labor movement, militancy, radicalism, and so on. And the backlash, of course, is the Republican Party, you know, the kind of Donald Trump types. The leaders of the backlash may talk Christ, but they walk corporate. Values may matter most to voters, but they always take a back seat to the needs of money once the elections are won. Abortion is never halted. Affirmative action is never abolished. I'm not sure that's all true, but we follow the argument. The cultural industry is never forced to clean up its act. Their grandstanding, the grandstanding leaders never deliver. Their fury mounts and mounts, and nevertheless they turn it every two years to return to their right-wing heroes. They turn their right-wing heroes for, to office for a second, third, or twentieth try. The trick doesn't age. Vote to stop abortion. Receive a rollback in capital gains tax. <coughs> Vote to make our strong country strong again. Receive deindustrialisation. Vote to screw politically correct college professors. Receive electricity deregulation. <laughs> Vote to get governments off our back. Receive conglomeration and monopoly everywhere from media to meatpacking. Vote to stand tall against terrorists. Receive social security private privatisation. Vote to strike a blow against elitism. Receive a social order in which wealth is more concentrated than ever before in our lifetimes. That's why supporting refugees and an internationalist response to uh, uh, attacks on our jobs and our working conditions is actually the only way that, that a trade union leader can actually be a good trade union leader, and I'll leave it at that.